Welcome to another EduMed video and this is the final of the settings that you would want to set on APRV, how to set the T low or the time at which it's at the low pressure. Again we'll go very briefly over what's in APRV, how to then we'll talk about how to set the T low and finally a few cautions about mistakes that people make and things that people miss when setting the time of which the ventilator is at the low pressure. As I've said throughout this series, if you haven't seen my video series on the basics of ventilation, please go back and watch those first, because it'll all make a lot more sense once you understand the basic physiology of what you're trying to achieve with mechanical ventilation. With that being said, you will know that this is the most important picture and the picture that I want you to have in your mind whenever you're managing a patient on a mechanical ventilator or even any patient who's not, who's hypoxic or hypercapnic. Essentially, all gas exchange that needs to happen in the lung depends upon two things. One is the alveolar is open and two, that there's blood flowing through that um, area of lung which is being ventilated. As long as the alveolus is open, there will be gas exchange. And it is always important to remember that. APRV is just a fancy way of saying essentially extreme CPAP. What we're trying to do is to keep the lungs open for as long as possible. And the way we do that is by using a high pressure for a long period of time to maintain oxygenation for as long as possible and to recruit up as many alveoli as possible. And that's really all that oxygenation depends upon, the fractional inspired concentration of oxygen that you're giving and that the alveoli remain open. The longer the alveoli are open for, the more oxygen will diffuse into the lungs, uh, into, the, uh, uh, into the capillaries. The other really important thing is alveolar blood flow. And people often forget the second half of that picture, which is the blood flowing around the capillary. You must maintain right ventricular output and cardiac output in general. And so you, the cardiovascular and the respiratory system are very closely entwined. And if you don't optimize both of them together, it doesn't matter how clever your ventilatory strategy is, the patient will still be rendered hypoxic or hypercapnic. In terms of the alveolar blood interface, really, this is a matter of time. If the patient has infection or pulmonary edema as the underlying cause for their hypoxic respiratory failure, you need to give antibiotics, you need to give diuretics, and you need to give time for these things to work. Of course, chest physio and removing sputum plugging is vital and a really important thing to do in any patient who is hypoxic or hypercapnic. But for the most part, APRV is a temporizing measure till the treatments that you're giving for the underlying condition has started to take effect and improved the a disruption in the alveolar blood interface and reduce that distance down to the one cell thickness between the alveolus and then the capillary one cell wall. Carbon dioxide on the other hand in terms of bulk movement of gas is dependent purely upon minute ventilation and minute ventilation is a function of the tidal volume multiplied by the respiratory rate. As with oxygenation, it's all well and good to have perfect ventilation, but you must make sure you match the ventilation and the perfusion so you're not um, ventilating areas of lung that have no blood flow to them and you're maximising the outflow of blood from the right side of the heart and into the left side, thus allowing it to be oxygenated and then taken around to the rest of the body. APRV works slightly differently in that it's also got an additional mode of CO2 removal. By keeping all of the alveoli open for as long as possible and maintaining a continuous column of air from the alveolus through to the ventilator, if you imagine the alveoli are full of lots of carbon dioxide, the ventilator has no carbon dioxide, you're going to get passive diffusion down that concentration gradient. Now, how do we set our t -low? Out of all of the settings in APRV, this is the, probably the one that takes a little bit of time to actually calculate and get right, but really, really important that you do. Because if you set your T low wrong, you can get rid of all of the benefits of APRV. And this is often what I see 
is the main mistake people make when putting people on APRV and finding that they're not responding to it. It's because they haven't set their T low appropriately. If you go back to the talk on the pressure low or on the original um, talks on introducing APRV, you will know that the way in which we maintain alveolar recruitment during the release phase or the expiratory phase of APRV is by having a very short expiration. This is in the matter of a, a fraction of a second. And by doing so, you allow gas to escape, but you don't allow enough time for the pressures to equalise between the ventilator and the lungs. And so you maintain the alveolar recruitment. Now, the way in which you have to set this is quite specific. What you do is you put a patient onto um, a volume control mode of ventilation to begin with. And if you've read, if you've seen the video on how to set the P high, you know you need to do this in order to understand what your plateau pressure is so that you can set your peak pressure. Similarly, when you're looking at the expiratory flow, you need to see how much time it's taking for the gas to escape. The reason this is important is different patients have different calibers of um, large airways and the smallest airways. For example, if you've got COPD or asthma, you may have a slightly obstructive um, picture to your expiratory phase, and so it takes that much longer. And they're generating a lot more auto peep, and therefore the pressure inside the lungs remains that much higher. And so for these patients, you need a slightly longer expiratory phase, i.e. a T low. So how do you calculate it? Well, the first thing that you do is you look at the flow time curve and you look at one expiration, which you can see here in the red curve. And you look at the maximum expiratory flow rate. And on the Y axis, the negative Y axis, what you've got there is the um, mils per minute or litres per minute usually. You take the peak of the expiration, the peak flow out of the lungs as 100%. So let's say it's 100 litres per minute to make the maths easy. Then you want to see how long it takes to go from that peak expiratory flow rate down to 75% of it. And you can see on the top is a patient with a restrictive picture or a patient with normal lungs, where it takes a relatively short period of time to release 75% of the peak flow. However, a patient with COPD or asthma, you can see that it takes a lot longer to drop down the um, peak flow. Now, again, if you look at that, you're going from uh, say 50 litres per minute to 25 litres per minute and for patients with COPD or obstruction rather than looking for 75% drop you're looking for a 50 to 60% drop in peak expiratory flow rate so if you've got 50 litres per minute you want to wait for it to drop down to 25 litres per minute and you take that time the reason you wait for more of the gas to escape is because it takes that much longer for gas to escape if you've got obstruction with small airways disease, as you would do, for example, in COPD or asthma. So to look at this exactly on the ventilator, what you want to do is look at a peak at a um, at the pressure, which you can see at the top, and the flow um, graph that you can see in green. Now this is a pressure vent. This is a volume mode of ventilation. So the um, you've got the peep, which is a straight red line, and then it slowly starts to increase up the pressure. And this is the volume being generated by the ventilator. So say it's been told to give five hundred mils of um, gas. What it does is it slowly increases the pressure up and up and up till it hits five hundred mils, and then it releases. And when it releases, you get flow going negative, and then. As the lungs start to empty, the rate of flow of gas slowly drops off until the lungs are completely empty. So what you want to do is the, look at the expiratory phase, which is the drop down negative, and then it slowly comes up to baseline. Draw a line along that from the point of maximum peak expiratory flow rate 
upwards, which is the dotted line that you see there. And then put, two, put a line across from 75% of that maximum flow rate. So, for example, if you've got 100 litres per minute is the maximum flow rate, put a line at 75, so you've got 25% drop in the f um, peak flow rate. And then you measure the amount of time that it's taken to hit that 75% of the peak expiratory flow rate. And that is your T low. And you can calculate this on the ventilator by drawing calipers and freezing the frame. You can also eyeball it as well. And generally speaking, most of us freeze the screen, have a look and eyeball 75% of the peak expiratory flow rate and then see roughly how long that's taken. Now, as I said, the reason we want to do this is to try and maintain alveolar recruitment. You can see that even at the ventilator side, which is what this is measuring, you can see that the pressure isn't actually completely hitting zero, even though the PLO we know we've set at zero. The reason for this is that we're, pressure, we're monitoring and maintaining pressure within the lungs and in the circuit by reducing the amount of time that it goes down to that low pressure. So we're not allowing enough time for the pressures to completely equalise with what the ventilator is trying to give, which is zero at P low. Again, this is a slide just to show the typical settings that we put on for a patient that we start on APRV. And you can see here that the T low is usually between 0.3 and 0.5 seconds. Sometimes patients with uh, obstructive disease, you can go up to 0.7 and very rarely up to one second. But it's useful to know what the general normal um, T low settings are so that you know that your calculation is roughly correct. There are a, p a couple of cautions with APRV. The first is bronchospasm. Just because you've set a patient with a T low at a certain amount, it doesn't mean it'll always be appropriate. If a patient starts to become wheezy, if they start to develop um, increased um, airways resistance, then it might be that you need to reevaluate their T low. If patients have fixed airways disease, they often need longer expiratory phases, and so their T lows tend to be longer. So use the general rule of obstructive patients. 50 to 60% of the peak flow rate is the time that you want to use, whereas for normal patients or for patients with ARDS, you want to use 75% of the peak expiratory flow rate as the time. If patients develop secretions, again, this can block off the expiration, and therefore patients may need slightly longer expiratory phases, i.e. their T low may need to be extended. Realistically, the more important thing to do is to clear those secretions because it's an easy fix for these patients. So either bronching them or doing bronchial lavages or aggressive chest physio, which these patients should be getting regularly anyway, because it's the only way you're actually going to be moving these patients forward in the longer term. It's worth considering what happens if the compliance improves, which is what we're hoping happens when the patients actually start to get better. As their infection resolves, as you offload their volume and therefore their lungs are less sodden. Well, at this point, um, you find that the PO2 may actually start to drop. Why is that? Well, if you think about it, the compliance is improving, so the lungs are starting to spring back quicker. If you set your T low when the lungs were really bad, full of pus, full of lots of fluid, what can happen is that they've got very low compliance, so it takes it's a lot slower for the lungs to actually come down to uh, the 100%, from 100% of the peak expiratory flow rate to 75%. Now, as the lung compliance improves, the lungs spring back a lot quicker. So now the T low is actually too long. And so you're allowing alveolar collapse. So as patients improve, it's always worth revisiting your T low. Generally speaking, your T low will come down as patients improve. For the most part, we're only talking about fractions of seconds, so it doesn't matter if it goes from 0.5 to 0.4. But if they're especially patients with COPD, where you might have patients with T lows of as long as 0.8 seconds, that might resolve down to even 0.5 seconds, which can make a big difference in terms of alveolar recruitment and loss of recruitment if it's too long.
Similarly, if compliance reduces, if patients develop collapsed lungs or they are, have massively positive net body balances in terms of their fluids, then you might find that the expiratory phase is just too short and the bulk movement of CO2 is not enough. And so then the CO2 might start to creep up. In those cases, it's always worth re-looking at the peak expiratory flow rates, putting them back onto a conventional mode of ventilation and seeing whether you're getting adequate amounts of exhalation uh, during a release phase. So overall, it's worth knowing how to set a um, a T low and the way to do it is by looking at the peak expiratory flow rate. If the patient has a restrictive lung defect such as ARDS you want to use 75% of a reduction in the peak expiratory flow rate and the amount of time it takes as your T low. If you've got a patient with obstructive disease such as asthma or COPD you want to use 50 to 60% of the peak expiratory flow rate and the time it takes to drop down to that as your T low. Always be mindful that the patient's condition is continuously changing. If they develop bronchospasm, if they start to become very fluid overloaded, you must revisit the T low. This is probably the most important setting in APRV because this is where you could potentially lose all of the good work that your P high um, is doing, that high pressure, the extreme CPAP. Because if you lose that alveolar recruitment, it takes a while for it to come back. And so it's really valuable to try and keep it. So always revisit what you're doing and always make sure that the patient condition is adapted to the ventilation settings that you're giving. And that's usually shown by your PO2 starting to get worse or your CO2 starting to increase. That shows that there's been a physiological change in that patient and you must adapt and respond to that. I hope you found this video helpful. If you have, please like it, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notification um, because we'll be pr producing a huge number of videos over the next few months and I hope that they'll be useful for you.